the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. And in the year 2004, she actually founded Woman of the World, WOW Ministry. That's going all over also the planet. I think she's in 20 countries already. So with that, Dr. Lisa, would you come and just... Give us Jesus. Let's welcome her as she comes tonight. And this is especially just for you. I hope it fits your needs. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you. Uh, you can be seated so I can see all of you. I did ask for the Fisher-Price pulpit, but uh, Toys R Us was out of them. So <clears throat> These guys always do something to me when I come because there's a slight difference I'm not quite five feet, and Pastor Jim is 6'6", six, six, so or whatever. I mean, he's huge. <laughs> anyway, I know a lot of you don't know me. That's fine. You're going to get to know me a little bit better right now. I'm Dr. Lisa Gilfillan. I'm from a huge Italian family. That's one of the reasons I'm so small. I never got enough to eat. Um, <laughs> growth was a little stunted. No, it's not at all. We were all small. In fact, my maiden name is Amicarelli which means little friend in Italian. So, through the centuries, we've been little and friendly. You're in a safe place, don't be afraid. Tonight, we're gonna talk about emotional recovery. And you need somebody like me to talk about that. You don't need somebody who's all sober, just had a bunch of lemon juice, topped off with something else that made them absolutely constrict. You need somebody like me who's been through some real things in life. God's healed me and help me to bring healing to others. I just really want to con- confess that tonight. Not that, uh, you know, to survive is not any kind of shame. You know? <laughs> Survival is good. <laughs> to get through emotional trauma is not bad, it's wonderful. I always tell my kids, the oldest person in the room is the strongest. You know, we've gotten through more. And my one daughter always tends to add one century to my age. So whenever she talks to me, she says, well, that would be something that a 151 year old would do. And she always makes me feel so. I said I look really great for 151. Um, But tonight I want to talk about emotional recovery because I think it's the key to just about everything. So many times as Christians, we can over spiritualize things. We think that reading the Bible and praying is going to solve all our problems. And believe you me, that is a significant part of helping you to get on the right track. I'm not diminishing the role of the word and prayer. But tonight, we're also going to face some things and see other ways that God uses to heal. Because our God is a healing God. And in John 10.10, Jesus cried this out. He said, the thief, that's Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Why would he say that if he didn't mean it? He also talked to us about tribulations. He talked to us about trials. He talked to us and told us that there would be times when it would be difficult to be a Christian because opinions from the world would be very hard. Persecutions would come. There would be difficulties that would arise. But he said, I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. I also find that people are sometimes unrealistic about life. By this age, I expect that there will be suffering. I know that maybe when you're really small and you've only known kindergarten and cupcakes and Crayola crayons, that you might not think that there's suffering in the world. But I've been around, I've seen it, I've experienced it. I assume that there will be suffering in the world, but I also know that there is healing. I also know that there is great joy. I also know that I don't have to accept everything that the enemy would try to foist upon me. But instead, I'm gonna move in the will and the way of God so that I can have the most whole life on earth as possible. Now, we're never gonna have complete wholeness this side of heaven. That's okay. But you know what? We can have life and life more abundantly, just as Jesus promised. First of all, number one point that I'd like to make is that all people suffer. Nearly all the time I deal with people, 
when they're in misery, they tell me that I wouldn't know what they've been through, that I couldn't understand, that nobody suffered like them. We all think that because we're the only ones we've ever known. Think about it. As far as I know, no one else in here has been in another one's b person's body, another person's soul, another person's head, right? You might think that you know what your spouse thinks, but you'll be surprised sometimes. <laughs> I've been married to that guy almost 26 years, and he still shocks me. <coughs> sometimes he still says things that are really smart that just blow me. And he said, you didn't think I'm smart? As of course I think he's smart. <laughs> he has a British accent. <laughs> Come on. Everything that someone with a British accent says sounds smarter. <laughs> I'm from Detroit. I can be as intellectual as possible. But still, if I speak and then my husband says the exact same thing, everyone says, Baron, good observation. <laughs> but I'm not bitter. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not bitter, OK? I'm getting better. Now, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention says, that about 19 million Americans suffer from depression. That's a lot, 19 million Americans. And women suffer from depression twice as much as men do. I have a few theories on that. I think maybe women might be smarter. They might know more of what's really going on. <laughs> <laughs> no, just a joke. That's, a, that's too much of a dig. If I'm into emotional recovery, I got to be into emotional recovery for the males, too especially since you guys are a little challenged. I've got to help every way I can to bring health and healing to those with XYs instead of XXs. Yeah, XX. Look at the fullness of that. You lost a whole part of a chromosome. Oh, man. There's a lot of information on this part of the chromosome. So we bear with those who are weak. All right, women? I need you to be kinder to the men in your life. No, no. Women suffer from depression twice as much as men do, maybe because they're more sensitive to the needs of others, and they don't only suffer their own concerns, but they are very worried about their kids, their parents, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe because women also have unrealistic expectations. Unlike a lot of females, I don't really enjoy fairy tales, because we're always waiting for some guy to come and get us. But do you notice, <laughs> a lot of times when we're waiting for that guy, he takes a long time to show up. <laughs> Snow White is there in a coma, <laughs> getting whiter by the moment. <laughs> Where is that man? OK? Rapunzel. I mean, she had to assist the guy. Because if he didn't have that long hair to climb, he would have never worked out a way to get to her. You know, give me a break. I think that's another reason why women are depressed, because they have unrealistic expectations of what the world's going to be like. That's why I always like the anti-Cinderella stories, where the girls rescue the guys. Just because we need to have a little bit of equal opportunity heroism here. You know, it can't always be you guys. And, and guys, I, I appreciate you. I know you are also programmed to protect, and I, do, I really do admire that. But uh, I don't always want to be protected by you. I want to be, to a certain amount, self-sufficient in God, OK? So my first point is all people suffer. Jesus suffered. In Isaiah 53, 3, it says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, the great thing about Jesus is, even though he was so despised and rejected, and can you imagine, I mean, <laughs> Being the Lord of the universe and coming to earth, seeing what was going on firsthand, experiencing hunger, thirst, weariness, it must have been really quite a change for him. <laughs> it wasn't heaven, that's for sure. And yet, even though he experienced all of this grief, he didn't necessarily show it all the time. He didn't necessarily act depressed. He had his times of weeping. They'd be short, then he'd go and act on something. But I just want to explain that all people suffer, including Jesus. And because Jesus suffered, he understands what we go through. This is important to understand. This is important to realize. Hebrews 4.15 in the message says, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, 
but to sin. He's gone through everything we've endured, but he didn't sin. And when we begin to think that we're the only people who suffer, we start to go on a downward spiral that makes emotional recovery very difficult. If you really think you're the only one in the world who has done something, you become so narcissistic <laughs> that you can't even see the ways that God is trying to heal you. It's like that old story where a guy is on the roof of his house, it's been flooded, and he says, Lord, save me. And somebody comes by in a rowboat, get in. No, I can't, I'm just asking the Lord to save me. And a, a scuba diver comes by, get on my back. I've got oxygen, I'll, I'll get you to safety. No, I'm waiting for the Lord. Finally, a helicopter comes, tries to lower a rope so that the man can get off the roof. He still says, no, I'm waiting for God. He drowns, goes to heaven. He says to the Lord, why didn't you save me? He said, I sent the rowboat, the scuba diver, the helicopter. What more do you want? Well, the first thing we have to know is that everybody suffers. And so because of that, we can be sure that God will send a, robot, a rowboat, a scuba diver, and a helicopter because he's sensitive to our suffering. He knows what we go through. Eli Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor, says that human suffering anywhere concerns men and women everywhere. I think that that's a great equalizer. It can't be joy because people experience different types of joy. I looked, for example, at the royal wedding. I know some of you, so romantic, just couldn't take your eyes off of Kate or Will. All I could think of was ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> in a time when people are starving in the Horn of Africa, we're just examining all of Kate's outfits and looking at her little sister, Pippa. Honestly, who names their kid Pippa? <laughs> I don't want to go into it, because I know that anything said with a British accent sounds more intelligent, <laughs> including Pippa, Pippa Middleton, Pippa. I'm praying for Pippa's soul, okay? That's what I'm praying for, but not for her wardrobe, okay? Albert Hubbard says, suffering makes kinsmen of us all. If you've been through something, you feel more for someone else who's enduring that at the present moment. I think sometimes that's why I've had so many different types of experiences. Because when I was young and didn't know anything and didn't have had much hardship, I couldn't really counsel people who had been through something. But the older I got, and the more I faced, the more I experienced, the more I knew what suffering was, that all of us suffer, but also the more I knew, number two, that God intends to heal us. God intends to heal us. He will not leave you in a place of suffering just so you get a good experience. He intends to heal us, but sometimes we thwart him with our words and our actions. I see it again and again, in my own life too. You know, I'll, I'll ask God, why can't I have what I want right now? Having served the Lord for 33 years now, I see why he hasn't given me certain things right now. But when I was young, I didn't know why things weren't always instantaneous. I just figured he was a withholding God. He was a God who didn't keep his promises. Having been with him this long, I know that he intends to heal. And I know that he keeps every word that he says. He does things differently than we do. But he does things more perfectly, more completely, more efficiently more wholeheartedly than we do. Have you noticed something? <clears throat> when you get something new, you love it, don't you? Oh my goodness. I, I think we've had one new, well, maybe, you know, two new cars, two new cars, and usually they're used. And I remember the first time we got this one new car, I just thought it was beautiful. I love the smell of the upholstery. I loved its color. I tried to keep it clean. That lasted two, three weeks. And um, now, you know, you have kids and everything like that. And then after a few years, I started looking at other cars. I was kind of being polygamist about my cars, you know. <laughs> I wanted sister cars. 
brother cars, whatever. Um, and, and I remember the Lord actually rebuked me about this. He said, Lisa, when that car was new, you loved it. You thought it was the best thing ever. Now it's got a few years on it and you're not grateful. I'm not going to get you another car until you become thankful for the one you have now. Whoa, that was a big lesson. And I had to really practice some thankfulness <laughs> because there were days I looked at that car and said, I don't like this car. I'd like a new car. I'd like another car. But it didn't matter. God's timing was perfect. He intended to get me another car, just like he intends to heal. But sometimes it's not on our timetable. However, I can assure you that it's going to be better than you thought it would be. I can tell you that. I can tell you that from years of experience, and I'm sure that there are many people in this room who could attest to the same thing. Now, in Psalm 147.3, it says, He, this is the Lord, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Ah, I tell you, sometimes I just read scriptures like that. I also love the part in Luke where Jesus unfurls the scroll and he says, I have come. <laughs> to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, my goodness. To set the captives free. Oh, I just can imagine sitting there, hearing the Lord of the universe say those words, the power that must have emanated out of him. And I can still feel it thousands of years later because the Lord intends to heal. Now, just like point number one was all people suffer, I want to say something in point number two, God intends to heal us, that might be a paradigm shift in your mind, in your heart. Meaning it might be something that you have to adjust in the way you view the world. I'm actually surprised that there's as much joy and goodness as there is. I am. You know, the reason that we have a lot of bad news on the news is because truly good news outnumbers bad news. And so they focus on that which is lesser in quantity. If bad news were the order of the day, then the news would always be celebrating good things, wouldn't it? Really, truly, truly. The amazing thing about the world is that there's more goodness and light, healing, friendship, love, brotherhood than we necessarily would think there would be. Look at us. We're a bunch of misfits. And that's just in this room. I mean, I'm talking about... In the whole earth, we have people of so many different ideologies, educational levels, socioeconomic levels. They have different ideas about what is good and evil. I'm surprised that evil's not just running the day. That also assures me that God intends to heal because the norm is happiness. The punctuation is sadness. The norm is that things are going well. The tragedies are blips in the screen. If you don't get that about life, it's going to be difficult for you because you're going to see it as one continuous bad time when in reality, it's a pretty good time and then we have a hard time and it's a pretty good time and then we have a hard time and it's a pretty good time and then we have a hard time. There is more love, more happiness, more joy involved. That should show us that God intends to heal. And number three, healing comes in various ways. And this is the last point, but this is what I'm going to concentrate on the most tonight, about emotional recovery. Healing comes in various ways. We can't put the Lord in a box and say, this is the only way he can do it. Barron always says that if we think of 1,000 ways the Lord is going to do something, He'll do a one thousandth and one way. And he says it with a British accent so it sounds even more intelligent. <laughs> you know that what that guy says is right because he's got the British accent. It so annoys me at times. Sometimes when I can't get something done on the telephone, I hand it to Baron and I say, plumb up the British accent. And he just says, oh, I'm wondering if you could help me. Suddenly, everybody at that call center in India is just ready, you know. <laughs> shout, they colonized you, you stupid people. 
They took your land. They took your riches. Why are you listening to him? Oh, I'm so happy that you can help me today. Yeah. Oh. My American accent, oh, you're a yank. I don't want to talk to you. you know, it's horrible. Again, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. I need to make that clear. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in the message says, no test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Oh, I can't tell you how many times the Lord has brought this verse to my remembrance. Whenever I say, I can't do it, he always says, oh, yes, you can. Uh, whenever I say, I, I can't bear it, he's like, oh, yes, you can. I knew it was going to happen. I'm right here with you. You can take it. I've got your hand. We're going to get through this. He will never be let you pushed beyond your limit. You might think so. I've had parts and times in my life where I felt like I was going to completely snap or crack. But every time, the Lord has undergirded me. He's helped me. He saved me. He strengthened me. And in that strengthening, he has made me healthier as a person and better as an individual who helps others. He has never left me without a means of escape. He's never left me past what I could endure. Now, another thing that believers don't often think about, I, I, I like to study how God heals and how healing occurs in the natural world too, emotional and physical. I was going to be a doctor. Um, I really wanted to be a doctor. I loved the idea of being a doctor. And when I was 20 and only a few years old in the Lord, the Lord expressly told me, you will not be a doctor, you will be a missionary. And believe it or not, that was my downward spiral. When the Lord told me I couldn't do something I wanted, I got rebellious and I told him, well, if I can't do what I want, then I don't even want to live. I think I'll commit suicide. That's how rebellious I was. I'm ashamed to say, it. right now it sounds just ridiculous. It sounds utterly disgusting that I spoke that way to the Lord of the universe. But before God, I have to admit that that's true. And I went into a downward spiral because he said I couldn't be a doctor. I had to be a missionary. And there were so many reasons why I went into the downward spiral. One was that my sister had died when I was 11. And we weren't Christians yet at that time. So I wanted to make some good out of her death. That's not a healthy thing to do. You don't need to make something good out of any tragedy. The Lord needs to make something good out of a tragedy. That's a word for somebody here. I don't know for whom, but it is. You're trying to make something good out of something bad, and the Lord's saying, no, I'm the one who turns all things to the good. Hmm, okay. Uh, also, I wanted the nice car. I wanted a nice house. I wanted the prestige of being Dr. Lisa Gilfillan. Well, actually, at that time, it was a Micarelli. Dr. Lisa a Micarelli. Would have made a good spaghetti sauce name, I think, but um, <laughs> he didn't want me to be Dr. A Micarelli. He wanted to be Reverend a Micarelli. And I went into a downward spiral until the Lord taught me some of the things that I'm sharing with you today. Of course, I've learned a lot more <laughs> in the uh, 31 <coughs> Months, I mean years, uh, since that happened. It's been a long time, guys. <laughs> Healing often works from the outside to the inside. And this is what I see to be wrong sometimes in the way that we approach emotional recovery. Sometimes we think that if we can just pray enough and read the word enough that we're going to get healed. But that's inside. Let's just talk for a moment about how we're made before God. He gives us a body. He gives us a soul, which is the seat of our emotions, our will, and our intellect. And he gives us a spirit. Now, when we become a Christian, our spirit becomes renewed. It's completely different in God. We've gone from darkness into light. Our spirit really isn't the part of our, body, of our, of our makeup that we have to contend with. Our spirit wants to do what the Lord wants us to do. That's why you have a fight with yourself sometimes. 
you don't want to get out of bed to go to church, but you feel like you should. I can tell you it's not your body encouraging you to go. It's not your soul encouraging you to attend. It's your spirit saying, get up out of this bed. I unfortunately need the soul and the body to keep walking. <laughs> now, this might sound funny to you, especially those of you who are athletes. You're really in tune with your bodies, okay? Those of us who are more academic are more like brains on a stick, <laughs> right? That's what I am. I'm more like a brain on a stick. My stick is getting a little larger. It's more like a brain on a log. But I started out a brain on a stick. All right? I need you to get a mental picture of this. Okay? We're all different. Some of us are hearts on a stick. We're all emotion. Oh, the drama queens and the drama kings. I broke my neck. <laughs> I broke up with my boyfriend. <laughs> hearts on a stick. And then there are you men and women out there with the toned abs and the nice biceps. You are biceps on a stick. <laughs> Sometimes we're knocking on the door. Hello, brain, are you in there? Hello, do you have any heart? No, I just have to compete. We're all a little bit different in our makeup, OK? And even as I'm saying this, you're thinking, I'm that on a stick. You know, I'm a brain on a stick. I'm a heart on a stick. I'm biceps on a stick. Oh, I'm starting to get hungry. But no, OK, no. Let's not, I don't want to digress. This is just wrong, OK? Yeah. But you're getting what I'm saying, aren't you? And if we think about ourselves like that, instead of as a whole being, it's going to be harder for us to recover. I realized that I just thought of my, my body as a place that helped my brain get around. So I could have been in one of those horror stories where my brain goes out, it's in a bottle, and I'm just directing my body, you know? Body, go to this place, go to, you know. Some of you are like that with your hearts. Some of you are like that with your bodies. You could do without the heart and the brain. But truly, we're made to be one, okay? We are really spirit, soul, and body. So when you heal, even emotionally, you heal physically, emotionally, and then spiritually, what's just happening is that when you begin healing physically and emotionally, your spirit comes un more under con the con you know, master control system. It is controlling you instead of the flesh and the soul controlling it. Do you are you getting what I'm saying? This is important because it means that you have everything you need within yourself, in God, again, because <laughs> in him we live and move and have our being, to heal. Your spirit is healed. Your spirit is whole. It's your soul and your body that has to catch up. But your spirit is already whole. And I need to tell you that that's why sometimes people get instantaneous emotional healings. Because somehow, by the precious spirit of God, by the sword of his word, it cuts through all of the junk in the body and the soul, gets right to the spirit, so that the spirit opens up and blossoms, and it realizes, I don't, I don't need the bad effects of the body. I don't need the bad effects of the soul. I'm healed. I'm healed in Jesus. I'm whole in Jesus. It doesn't always happen that way. And usually, and I, I've really been doing research on it, the, the healing comes from the body to the soul the, to where the spirit can then take control. All right? Just hear me out. The reason that the Lord has us do physical acts, like breaking bread, drinking at communion, the reason that he has us sometimes fall to our knees or raise our hands or dance is because he's trying to communicate to us that we are an holistic being of body, soul, and spirit. Otherwise, we could just be kind of Spock-like for all you Trekkies out there and just think. That is not logical. And, but if you begin to get it like that, your ears will grow in a very funny way. <laughs> I speak as one who knows, who, one who has been too brainy. My ears, I'm telling you, they were going haywire. I had to conform to the Lord so that he could change my body and my soul. Um, and 
in the physical, if, you're, if you've just experienced a deep trauma, if you've had grief, maybe you lost a loved one, maybe you were divorced and you didn't want to be. You know, uh, a wise man told me, it's better to be single and wish you were married than married and wish you were single, okay? So some people are actually happy when they get divorced. Other people are quite crushed, and I understand that. I think I would be quite crushed. I think Baron would be even more so. Uh, because I'm Italian. My mother did warn him when we were engaged that our family did not believe in divorce, only murder. And um, I'm just, again, giving him a little friendly reminder. Um, it's been working well for almost 26 years. He's been doing a good job. My Uncle Tony is hanging in there. He's like 90. <laughs> and he's just watching. <laughs> he's watching all the time. OK. But when we get healed, from, it goes from the physical to the emotional to where the spiritual can often blossom. Now, beauty heals. Did you know that? This is something so important if you've been through a trauma. The reason why people take great solace by putting flowers on a grave or by hearing a great piece of music or by having a nice piece of chocolate, especially if it's foreign, mm. and maybe the advertiser has a British accent, so you know he's more intelligent, um, is because beauty actually heals. Now, I've done some research on this because real scientists have done research on this. And this is what Dr. Dan Villancourt of Loyola University of Chicago says. Beauty experiences, that means anytime you think something's beautiful, you see the ocean, you see the mountain, you like a whiff of perfume, you like the way the truffle looks on your plate. Beauty, yeah, I mean, I could really get into that. Beauty experiences boost the immune system and therefore enhance the healing process. We need beauty. We need to see something beautiful in order to heal. Corrie ten Boom, the Holocaust survivor, when she developed a home for fellow Holocaust survivors, one that her sister, who did go home to be with the Lord in one of the camps, had foreseen while they were in the midst of their misery, she said that they always had in the house Flowers and children, because the beauty of the flowers, their wonderful scent, the exuberance of the children, their innocence, was healing to the survivors. Now, do you understand why when we normally grieve, we're doing exactly opposite to what God would want us to do? What do we normally do? We stay in a darkened room, we go into bed, pull the covers up over our head, keep crying, 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 crying. Cry some more, go to the restroom, cry, cry, cry. It's true, right? But really, we've been programmed to heal through beauty and through experiencing physical confirmations and affirmations of the Lord's goodness to us. One of my friends who's a cancer survivor, uh, she had a lot of treatment at the City of Hope, and she told me that doctors there actually recommended that she go to the ocean and just stare out uh, at the horizon of the ocean because studies had proven that staring out into the ocean helped cancer survivors heal. And their findings were that one, beauty heals, just like I was telling you about Dr. Van Villancourt's study, and also that it gave them a sense of serenity. You know, the heavens declare the glory of God. You look around, and there are times when I'm moved when I see a little hummingbird, I think, only God could have made that. I see a flower and I start thanking God spontaneously. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm all by myself. It's not like I'm with Pastor Jim trying to make him think I'm holy. Well, anyway, pa Pastor Jim would know that I wasn't anyway. He, he's, he, he doesn't go for any bull. But you know what I'm saying? Even when I'm alone and nobody can be impressed, I'll break out into spontaneous praise when I see something beautiful. I've seen some guys do this too, but a lot of times... Um, it's been with females. It hasn't been with little birds and flowers. Um, oh, maybe those were construction workers. And maybe, oh, I don't even, I, I, I do digress. 
Okay. I also read a study by a secular group in Europe, and they said that people who lived in rural communities or in suburbs where there were lots of trees and lots of evidences of nature were more likely to believe in God than those surra surrounded by a man-made environment. And I can understand that. If you're surrounded by something that you've created, you think you're the creator. Okay? But when it comes to healing and emotional recovery, we need to get to a place that God has created so that we can see that we're among his beloved creation. A sparrow is important to him. We are much more so. He wants us to see beauty so that we will start physically feeling it and then emotionally healing also. You know, our bodies actually absorb pain. Now, you must know that if you've ever had a massage. All right? Even if someone's just giving you a back rub, you don't have to have a professional massage to figure this out. Have you noticed that there's a release? And you're like, I, I didn't know I was that tense. It's because our bodies absorb pain and stress. You really can notice that if you've had an injury and you've done something to modify your lifestyle in order to survive. Like maybe you've hurt yourself and you're kind of limping. And then one day, all of a sudden, oh, your foot doesn't hurt anymore. But you've still been limping. It's, it's a crazy thing, isn't it? And then you realize, I'm not even hurt. I'm not going to limp anymore. Well, the Lord often heals from the physical inward. This is just the way God is. When I was at the University of Michigan, my roommate was really interested in biofeedback. I thought it was crazy. Now she's Dr. Elizabeth Ozer. She's uh, up at University of um, California, San Francisco. And she was in the very early studies of how we can lower our blood pressure and our stress level by breathing properly, by thinking about flowers and children and cheery thoughts instead of guns and war and gangs and a lot of things that we experience. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she's a South African doctor, and she actually has studies, you can Google her. Her name is Leaf, L-E-A-F, <laughs> like a leaf, oh, so cute. Uh, Dr. Caroline, and it, she shows how trauma can leave black holes in your brain. Now, some of you may have seen uh, brain scans with black holes in them already from Romanian orphans who were studied. When they didn't have enough care as children, they got these huge black holes in their brain where they had diminished neurological capacity. They couldn't think as well because they didn't have care. Well, when we have trauma, we can actually get black holes in our brain. But you know what the great thing is? When we say God's word, when we start experiencing things of beauty, when we reprogram our self-talk that's destructive, those black holes start healing up. Don't get scared when you hear this. If you're having trouble, say, it must be my black hole, but I need to get rid of it. <laughs> Blame it on your black hole. Come on, you got to have somebody to blame. And Maya Angelou said this, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So many people are keeping secrets, and your body actually bears the brunt of it. Okay, so we go from, to, I'm talking still about emotional recovery, but sometimes we have to go from the physical to the emotional to where the spiritual takes over. Emotionally, know this, hurt people hurt people. All right? So many times people are so frustrated with others. But when people are acting really ugly, sometimes I even get words of knowledge. I can see what was in their past to make them like that. I had the strangest time where I actually could see a young woman being put into a trunk and driven into her apartment complex. And I thought, I've got, what has happened? I didn't eat pizza. I don't know what the problem is. Why am I seeing this? And so finally I just said to her, I see that you maybe had this problem because you were put into a trunk when you were a child and driven into your apartment complex. She burst into tears. She said, the landlord said that my mom and dad could only have one kid. So every time I went into the apartment complex, I had to be in the trunk. Only my sister could be seen. And then by dark of night, they brought me into the house, into the apartment. 
okay? Um, hurt people hurt people. And she was, went around hurting a lot of people because she was so emotionally distressed. But when the Spirit of the Lord placed a finger on that emotional memory and healed it, she was released. Only God. <laughs> Words affect us greatly, too. Dr. Caroline Leaf has some fantastic neurological evidence. What negative words do? Negative words make your brain patterns look like a dying tree. It's hideous. I like good trees. I don't like dying ones. I don't like Halloween trees. I liked Charlie Brown's Christmas, but I don't like that little tree. <laughs> In terms of, I want a big, fat, full tree. Okay? I'm glad he, Linus was kind and wanted to nurture it. But I don't want that in my brain. I want a full-grown tree in my brain that's full of life and healing. And when we say positive words, we can begin to recreate the neurological pathways in our brain. It's amazing. Do the research and you'll see. But you, more importantly, do it in your own life. Stop yourself when you're about to say something negative to yourself or to someone else. Because words create and they destroy. Mark 11, 25, 26 says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I know that's a hard one. Many times I've had to will to forgive. I've had to say, I don't feel it. I don't want to do it. I'm simply doing it to be obedient to your will. And do you know what? I feel a release. Every day it gets better and better. Every moment it gets a little bit easier. It doesn't get worse when you make a conscious choice for emotional recovery and for forgiveness. It gets better. The enemy will tell you, it's going to get worse. It's going to be horrible. Lucifer as a clam or something. Uh, Lucifer lobster. I don't know what this is. I need hand puppets. Um, but Anne Lamott got it right when she said, not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. You're going to die, not the rat. All right? That is what unforgiveness is. And there also have been times, I must confess, before you and the Lord, that I have forgiven someone just so that I won't have to drink the rat poison. Uh huh. That's okay too. You know, we always say, love your neighbor as yourself. That comes originally from Leviticus 19, 18. Don't seek revenge or carry a grudge against any of your people. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. That is a dictate from the Lord to help us to be emotionally recovered, to help us to be healthy. It's not going to do a bit of good for you to carry a sense of revenge and vengeance toward another human being. You're going to be drinking the rat poison. And that rat is going to be out scurrying about, eating his cheese in peace. You need to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I really encourage you. We have Breaking Free, the restoration ministry here at the church. If you're having problems with the emotional aspect of emotional recovery, you need to go. But I just want to conclude, when the physical and the emotional heal, the spiritual comes more into control. Then you see people who aren't flighty anymore. You see people who are balanced. You see people who don't let every little thing get them down. I kind of expect problems. I don't like them. I don't enjoy them. I expect them, but I also expect God to give me a solution. Amen. I'm going to conclude with the three main ways that healing comes. Number one, the Lord himself will intervene. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Many times, the Lord just speaks a word, and you're healed. I love that kind of way. That's easy. I don't have to do much. It doesn't take a lot of my time. 
Other times, though, number two, Christians will help other believers. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 in the message. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. Oh, boy, I like that. When somebody flourishes, we enter into the exuberance. That's completely Italian. I could do an Italian dance for you right now and throw you some mustacholi. <laughs> and the, one of the reasons that Christians help other believers is because the Lord comforts us and so we can help heal others. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. If you've been through it, you can help somebody else endure it. If you can say, I'm alive, I went through that, people will look to you. How do we defeat the enemy? We defeat him by the blood of the lamb. We had nothing to do with that. That's a precious gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. By the word of our testimony, God healed me from that. I endured that. He helped me triumph in that arena. And because we don't love our lives unto death, that's how we defeat the enemy. One of the main ways, though, is by giving our testimony to others so they can know that there's hope and healing for them. And number three, okay, three main ways healing comes. Number one, the Lord himself will intervene. Love it. Number two, Christians will help other believers. And number three, God will orchestrate circumstances to bring healing. Oh, he's awesome. Your job will lay you off. That boss who's been giving you a peptic ulcer, three weeks later you get the job of your dreams. Somebody who actually appreciates you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard of this happening, and it's even happened to myself. I went from having a, one boss, oh my goodness, she was Cruella. I'm telling you, I think she wore little Dalmatians on her, on her, in her coats. I mean, she was, whoa. And I went to having a boss that appreciated me. I was so grateful every morning, just so grateful. Look at what happened to Naomi. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, now look, at this is what happened to Naomi. Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. She lost her husband, and she lost both of her sons. She said to her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, that's where we get Oprah, they misspelled Orpah. <laughs> I'm not joking. Oprah will tell you that. She was telling me that last week. No, <laughs> no but, but she will tell you that. That's the truth. Orpah went back to her people. Ruth stayed with Naomi. But they went in a very, very indigent state. They were extremely poverty-stricken. Ruth stayed with her, helped her, and because she was helping her, she met Boaz, the man of her dreams. And they became married. Then Ruth had a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Ruth 4, 13 through 16. Do you see? This is what I want to focus on. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. This is what the Lord does. He sometimes orchestrates circumstances so that your life is restored, so that you're nourished, and you have your complete emotional recovery. People, everybody suffers. I'm still surprised, though, that there is as little suffering in the world as there is compared to all the great happinesses, falling in love, having kids, having a good dog, having a cat who gives you attention now and then, <laughs> riding a motorcycle and not getting into an accident, uh, seeing a beautiful sunset, having enough food to eat, having work that really engages you, having a family, 
of believers around you who are telling you, go on, you can do it. It's a lot of good things. Okay? Number two, God intends to heal you. Don't let the enemy say, oh, you've had this problem for 25 years. You'll always have this problem. No. This is the year it needs to stop. If you've had it for 25 years, it shouldn't be 26. And number three, healing comes in various ways. Remember that it often comes from the physical to the emotional so that the spiritual can take over and really rule the whole of your being. Now I want to pray. I know that there are people here, you've suffered loss. You probably, a lot of you probably wouldn't have come tonight unless you've had some suffering or you know someone who's been enduring something. And I just want to say that there's hope and healing in the Lord. And tonight you've been given some tools. However, nothing's really going to work completely until the spiritual is changed. I told you that often God heals from the physical to the emotional to the spiritual. But if you don't, if you don't have a good spiritual foundation, when you're healed up physically and emotionally, you're not going to have anything else. And the truth of the matter is that, as we saw, Jesus suffered. He came to earth in the form of a man. He was completely human. He was completely God. But yet, while he was here, he had to be under the dictate of earth. And he had to serve in his own humanity, not in his deity, not in his godliness. So he had to be tempted in everything and still not sin. He did that so that then he would be able to take all the sins that you and I have committed. And I tell you, my list alone is pretty long. And he would be able to say, I will take all of those sins on the cross. I will suffer and die and pay the price so that God and man can once again be united, so that there no longer will be separation, so that there no longer will be a divide. He died a completely sinless human, and he rose again after three days. He defeated hell. He defeated the forces of darkness that are trying to keep you in bondage. Now, people are very mystified. They don't know, is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Well, I've been doing a study on people who have had near-death experiences, and I'm really concentrating on the ones who went to hell. Because those ones aren't fun. And in fact, those ones are embarrassing for them to relate. There is a hell, unfortunately. But fortunately, there is a God who has made a way to get us out of hell. You can't do it by form and ritual. You can't do it by being good enough. You can't do it by being happy enough, depressed enough, <laughs> stoic enough, brave enough. It's not enough what you do. It all has to do with what the Lord God has done. I remember the first time I really heard the gospel, and when the gentleman said that Jesus had died on the cross for my sins, I actually said, so that's why he died? I said it out loud. It was such a revelation to me. I always thought that he just got a bad political rap. He was assassinated because he was a good guy, and he was causing trouble to some of the political leaders. I also thought that was a very stupid move. Here was a guy who could multiply food, who could heal people. I thought he was really good for most of the politicians to keep around. He'd just at least stimulate the economy. I mean, there'd be a lot less expenses in food and health care with Jesus around. <laughs> Let's be honest here. He could do everything. But the truth of the matter is that we've fallen short of God. And Jesus went to the cross so that all of the sins that we've committed could be placed upon himself, so that he could suffer the punishment, and so that as we believe in him, confess our sins, and ask him to direct our lives, we will be healed spiritually, and then emotionally and physically. If you haven't made that decision yet, I want everyone just to close their eyes for a moment. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life and be your savior, that means the one who rescues you from hell, and your Lord, the one who gets you to heaven, the one who tells you what to do the rest of your life, 
you need to make that decision today. It's not something you should be putting off, pondering. It seems like a pretty good decision. He did everything for you. You can do this one thing for him. And I remember the night that I became a Christian. I actually thought of it that way. He's taken all my sins. The least I can do is give him my life. Even though a few years later, I would rebel, wanting to be a doctor, wanting my own way, and having to really understand his lordship all over again. If you're in that situation, though, and you know you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, or you have asked him in the past, but you've turned away and done your own thing, could you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you? We're not going to embarrass you. I see you there in the back. That's wonderful. I see you there. Oh, my, that's wonderful. Anyone else? Anyone? Oh, yes, I see you there. Most importantly, God sees you. He's got supersonic sight. Oh, thank you. Ah, I see you there. Listen, what I want you to do is I'd like us all to open our eyes and stand up. And if you've raised your hand, I'd really like you to give me the privilege of praying with you. I'd like you to come to the front. We're going to say just a short prayer. Then we're also going to pray for everyone's emotional recovery. Don't worry, we're going to still get out at 8 o'clock. But people, if you raised your hand, come down to the front so that I can meet you and so that you can start a new life. Cool. That's awesome. Wow, great. Welcome. goodness what a beautiful bunch of people awesome I just am going to pray a short prayer then I'm going to turn you over to Pastor Dave there he's going to take you just to a room around the corner where he's going to give you some free literature don't worry I'm the craziest one at this church well no Pastor Jim our senior pastor okay I'm the second craziest one at this church he's not here today and he's a lot bigger than I am you could all take me even you you can take me I can tell so do not be afraid but we're going to pray really quickly. Then you're going to go with him. He'll explain some more things and give you some literature and also give you some things about a spiritual personal trainer, which is, you don't have to do it. It's a completely voluntary thing, but it's a friend who can help you along this road and get you up to speed quickly. Okay? Let's bow our heads. Father, could everybody pray this along with us? Just repeat after me. Father, Father I acknowledge that I've sinned. I acknowledge I've done wrong. I see now that Jesus... Is, is the only way. I understand that he died for my sins. I realize that he rose again. And I know that he's offering me this chance at salvation today. I accept it. I say sorry for my sins. I put my life in your hands, Jesus. Save me. And be my boss. And be my boss. In, Jesus In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you go right up, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that all of you did this. This is the, one of the best days of your life. I think it is the best day.